This is the IFF TV podcast. Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. I'm here joined by Kieran O'Cahlan and we are here <laughs> discussing. Did you like the way I did that? I did that. I like that now. That was good. I was like, O'Cahlan would be the would be current my pronunciation, but don't mind the Dundalk accent. <laughs> oh well, I tried my best to be fair, but uh, we're here doing. Did a great job. We're here doing the uh, season previews, and you're first up, and we're doing Dundalk. So I'm actually, mm. I actually kind of uh, headhunted you, especially to do this. So, um, you know, every time I'm up to Dundalk way, and uh, I need someone to talk to Dundalk, you're usually the man, and you know, seem to know everything regarding Dundalk. So I'm no better person to get for the job. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to the chat today. Obviously, um, there's been a lot of changes and stuff like that with Dundalk, so it's 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 good to get a. A different perspective on things so um looking forward to getting stuck in yeah well i think b- before we get into the signings kieran like mm. i think going into the season before last uh, at the end of, under vinnie perth i mean dundalk looked pretty unstoppable i know they lost the fai cup finals probably a bad memory but they won everything else like the uh, the league the united nations cup the extra time or no sorry the ea sports cup ea sports cup mm. and uh, there was one more i'm probably missing out on but they basically won everything except for the FAI Cup. And yeah. go it, it, like the start of last season, it was a slow start. But, you know, the lockdown came in and then it was the break from lockdown and things just didn't go Dundalk's way. And they just didn't look like the Dundalk f- from old in that point uh, of time. But kind of what were your thoughts on last season towards the end? You know, I know he's got into the Europa League and stuff like that. So kind of is a mixed season. Yeah, it was it was a very strange kind of aspect of of like it, it felt kind of the end of an era, so to speak, in in terms of Stephen Kenny and Vinnie Parth and Vinny. Um, look, look, there's there's no lying around this. There was media reports surrounding it that there had been accusations of of interference and in terms of team selection and and other things that came out in 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 the newspapers. But it, it was it was I didn't expect Vinny to go. If I'm honest with you, I thought they would have seen till the end of the year. I thought making a change, particularly in the midst of a European campaign, was a huge risk by the board of Dundalk FC, and they felt at the time that it was probably best. However, I think in terms of that, the players very much galvanised themselves, and like you have to remember, there's an awful lot of experience still within that side. But last year, you're talking about players that really came to the fore. The likes of Brian Garkland, and Gary Rogers had a very, very good second half of the season. Um, you know, Pat Hoban led the line very well. And but then the arrival of David McMillan and he brought his experience of of twenty sixteen. But then you still had the players like Dane Massey, you know, Sean Gannon, like all of these players and Patrick McElhain, all these players had European pedigree from twenty sixteen plus plus other league what title winning experience. So these guys knew what it takes and what the standard was expected in order to win and to be successful. The appointment of Filippo Flippi- Giovanioli was very left field. Like, I don't think a lot of people saw it coming. There was a lot of names kind of being batted around. I'm, I'm led to believe that a former Irish international striker was being muted, that he was going to come in. Um, however, Filippo was appointed on the basis that there was a connection between Filippo's uh, Academy and Pete Six Investments, which is the owners of Dundalk FC. There seemed to be a kind of a very kind of loose connection between the two. He's arrived in, but what he's brought in, and I think it's something that maybe Dundalk needed at that time, was a fresh voice and an impetus, but he kind of galvanised the group and made them very much a family. Now, from what I've been hearing, he's an exceptional coach. Like, he's a really, really good coach and is really looking into developing young players and bringing them through. So that's something that maybe has not been uh, very much at Dundalk's forefront during this kind of period that they've brought in tried and trusted or already established players, whereas in this idea, he'd be looking to bring players through. So that's something that that's exciting. You only have to look at um, Tony O'Kane's grandson, who um, Ryan O'Kane, who played against Bohemians the other day, he was he was absolutely exceptional at 17 years of age. Now, in terms of last season, you know we finished off the season with a high, a win in the FAI Cup, a Europa League campaign. Now, bear in mind we didn't collect any points, unlike the last time in 2016 we got four. 
Um, this time we didn't get any, but a lot of those games we showed a very different side, you know, a very a, a, a very different pedigree to the standards and which is expected in, in the league. And I think that we gave a good acquittal of ourselves. Now, I know we conceded three against Arsenal, but that was in the space of six minutes. It wasn't as if we were played off the park. You know, we had, we had a very direct game plan. And I thought in the games against Rapid Vienna, we really could have gotten something out of those games. But it was it, all in all, it was a very mixed bag. But we also have to remember during the course of that period, um, we lost a very good friend. A lot of us lost a very good friend in Harry Taff. And that would have had a huge effect on the team as well in terms of morale because he was kind of the, sometimes he was kind of like the glue that stuck the, the, the gang together. And he was a very close friend and confidant for a lot of people. So that, along with Vinny, like Filippo had a huge job going in there because it, not only did he have to kind of change the, the, the culture shift, he also had to boost the morale and the mood amongst the players. And I think um, while the players would have been sceptical, of course, they would have been going in. I think, judging by what Filippo presented to them at the start, he got them on board and they started to play from kind of pretty much straight away. Yeah, well, I think everything you've said there is, is a kind of good account from a Dundalk point of view because I don't mm. think from the outside looking in, a lot of people take those reasons into consideration when they see it. But for me, it makes a lot of sense. The stuff you've said there, obviously, about Harry Taff and, and stuff like that. I thought it was lovely what they did at the cup final when they, yeah. you know, they had the T-shirt and stuff down from top. That was a really nice touch by the club. So it's nice that they still remembering these people. Um, I think Vinny, Vinny, in fairness to him, what he done for the club after Stephen winning all those trophies. It did look like Dundalk were going to go on to dominate. It wasn't the case, but I think it, it does have to be remembered what a good job he did when he was in charge there oh, before listen, the last the, stint, you know. Oh, look, but there's no there's no two ways of it. Vinny was, Vinny was an integral part of that uh, whole era, this whole successful era. You know, he was he was Stephen's number two, and rightly so, he got the job. Um, you know, and he, he got that on merit on the basis of his work rate and basis on the work he did behind the scenes and in relation to his coaching. It's unfortunate that it ended the way it did. I wouldn't have, you know, for, for someone who has been part of the club since 2013, it was a very kind of sad way that it ended for him. Um, however, I think the, the, the there seems to have been, uh, judging from the outside, kind of looking in and from what, what I've read is that um, there seems to have been a complete breakdown in relationship. And when that happens, that that automatically brings a strain from, you know, from the top down. And players can players can sense in that. Players can feel that. And it does affect um, if the manager is coming in and he feels that he's under pressure, that reverberates through the squad and they then all, all of a sudden feel under pressure. So I think the European result to go away to SK Selje was... It, it was a it was a very tough hill to swallow, but I didn't expect him to be sacked or relieved of his duties um, before that. I would have thought he would have been given the opportunity to go on the Europa League run and see where he take it from there, and see at the end of the season where they could have had a whole whole year review on things and see how they got on. Yeah, that would I have been my that would have been my opinion, and that would have been my idea. Yeah, sorry, yeah, the, the connection there went to, for a sec. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> sorry. we were finished. Um, mm. But just what you said there, I thought, you know, it kind of resonates with what's going to go to next is that, you know, you said it was it was sad, kind of an end of an era. And then mm. you've got a lot of players who have gone that have been there a while, Dane Massey, mm. Sean Gannon, just to name two really big ones. And Gary Rogers has obviously retired since. So they're three big characters gone. And I'm going to go through the rest of the outs. But just while, while I'm kind of thinking of, of those, just on those players leaving, you, you must be really sad to see them go or you must have been. Ah, yeah, absolutely. I was, I was like, like from working, you know, through media, different media forms, you you form a relationship with these people and you get to know them. And, you know, um, like players such as Dane Massey, he arrived from Bray Wanderers, you know, since his time at the club, like he's gotten married and had a kid, like, you know, and you, and you kind of like, you don't necessarily share in that thing, but you do know that these are kind of life events that happen. And then Sean Gannon, you know, I still think he had an awful lot to, to how would you say, to, to offer to the club. And then Gary Rogers, like, I mean, he's had a stellar career. And I think to to for, to have him 
part of your club during what's been such an illustrious career and for him to contribute to such a successful period of the of this of this era of this club is fantastic and you know he like all three of them um and i've and i've gone on record on on twitter and stuff like that saying that anytime you've asked them for an interview or a comment or anything like that they've been more than obliging as have all of the players at dundalk and it's yeah. it's it's a testament to that team that they you know they they really helped you and they really assisted you and stuff like that so um yeah it's it's a changing of the guard like dane massey um you know he's gone to Drogheda, so he's not gone too far. He's only up the road. But like, um, for Gary to retire on such a high Europa League, winning an FBI Cup, and um, Sean Gannon's departure to to Shamrock Rovers, our biggest rivals, it's it, you can see that it's kind of a changing of the guard a wee bit. But at the same time, you can't help but feel nostalgic for all the good times that you saw those players play in the white shirt. Well, I actually like the fact that you don't really hold a lot of bitterness towards them because I imagine that you've had good relationships with them over the times that they're there. And you have to remember yeah. they are humans and they have families and they do have to get paid. Yeah. And I think people have to remember listen, that too. Listen, at the end of the day, they're, um, they're, they're obliged to the contracts in which they're offered. And if it's no different than me or anybody else, you know, in this in this business or in any business, rather, if you are uh, afforded an opportunity to either earn more or have a contract that longevity that secures your mortgage payments for the next couple of years or your or whatever it may be, you have to take it like there's no question of it. At the end of the day, you have to take what's the best that's put in front of you. And if the contract offers which were placed in front of these players were not as competitive as those of others, then you, you know, while loyalty does come into it in some respects, you have to think of the longevity as far as I'm aware, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Especially with, with mm. League of Ireland contracts mm. and clubs and stuff like that. But I uh, just, I have the list of outs here. So uh, Josh Gatt, Sean Hoare has obviously gone to Shamrock Rovers as well. Mm -hmm. Sean Gannon, Jimmy Corcoran, Nathan Odua, Gary Rogers retired. John Mountain has gone to St. Pat's. Then Matthew, mm -hmm. we mentioned. Uh, Stefan Kolovich is gone. I'm not even going to try to say where he's gone. <laughs> Jamie Wynn. Gone back to Cork. Serbia. <laughs> somewhere, yeah, somewhere like that. Yeah. Uh, Will Patching and then Andrew Quinn. So they're all the lists that have, uh, mm. have basically left. But uh, on the re sign front, and obviously some big names there that you and big characters. Um, Pa Huben, Chris Shields, Patrick McElhenney, and Andy Boyle, Daniel Cleary, Greg Slogger, Dara Leahy. Um, Daniel Kelly, David McMillan, Sean Murray, Cameron Dummigan, Michael Duffy, Brian Gartland, and uh, Tanner Dogan. Tanner Dogan, Tan yeah. Um, just Tanner one Dugan, player, you, yeah, one player that you mentioned on the on the exits that we actually never got to mention there was John Mountney. Um, John Mountney's gone to St Pat's. He's joined Stephen O'Donnell up there, and uh, like John Mountney has been there even before Stephen Kenny. He he was signed by Sean McCaffrey in 2012 and he's been with us through everything and i always kind of said to him that i always said about john was that he was in in a lot of respects during stephen kenny's era he was stephen's you know go-to guy in europe and um, a very solid uh, dynamic player on the right wing and he's another player that's kind of been part of this whole revolution he was there when we were packing bags in order to pay their wages the following week and he's he's gone from rags to riches so to speak so um it's a new a new adventure for him and i wish him the very best of luck another another absolute cracking person so um i wish him the best of luck of pats there's there's no there's no grudges there either i don't have a grudge with anyone leaving um so i just thought it was important to to give him a a shout more as just as much as the rest of them Oh, a hundred percent. And I, I figured when I mentioned his name that you were going to anyway, so it, it all kind of worked yeah. out for the best. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, of the the bigger players that have stayed, though, you obviously key players, um, Michael Duffy, and obviously the way David McMillan finished last season, it was key to get him back resigned. I felt as well. David offers something different to Patrick. Patrick and different. Patrick Hoven and, and David McMillan are two completely different strikers in terms of their movement, in terms of the types of goals that they score. Um, so it's, you know, Patrick would be very much a player that would, uh, I would just say, hold the ball up and he would bring other players in 
play off the last man and then make it into the area. Whereas David McMillan would be very much the kind of player that would live off the shoulder of a of a defender and then he would he would beat them for pace. Also, David's dynamic aspect of sticking his head where you know uh, not a lot of people would stick their heads to is is he's he's a very brave individual and you can see that particularly in um, a couple of a couple of goals that he has scored, uh, particularly against like in European games. Remember the game against Rosenberg in 2017. It was a very low cross from from Michael Duffy, but his header t- completely took it away from the goalkeeper. A very brave goal, but he's known for that, and he's um, he, he just has a knack of being in the right place at the right time. And um, Patrick, look, I I could be here all day talking about the the, the type of striker he is, but um, he's so good and he's uh, such a powerful forward. Like he's he's an absolutely excellent player. But what they're going to do, and I think if Filippo plays this, plays these two players right, is that he's going to have to deploy different players for different games. And Patrick, while he may be used for a game, say, against Shamrock Rovers, David McMillan could be used a game against Gimpats. It depends on the centre-backs that he's playing. So it's it's very important that Filippo is able to deploy these kind of players um, going into this season that he knows the right player at the right time. I think you're correct in saying that, and mm-hmm. it's also good to have a you know a different option off the bench as well. But some of the yeah. ins as well, and Junior is one who obviously was top scorer there two years back. Um, just going to go through some of the ins now. Some of the pronunciations are a bit wild, so we'll do our best. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, Ole Eric Midstogen uh, from Klaxvik, um, Alessio Abibi, Rivas Andrus Jurkovskis, uh, Sonny Ragnar, Natas Stad, Sam Sta- Stanton, that was an easier one, Peter Cherry, yeah. that was a really easy, easier one, yeah. and the junior, Ogedi Uzokwe, I think I said right. and then, and then, <laughs> am I going to call him Jesus or Jesus Chino Perez, the Tinder man? I don't know. We, we, we haven't swiped right in that yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, first, uh, the the, uh, the Eric, who's come from Ki Klastovic, um, he looked like a really, really powerful player when he played against us in that playoff match. He scored the cracking goal against Gary Rogers, but you know he's remembered for that. But what he must be remembered is that he's a very dynamic midfielder, which but he can plays in that kind of number ten role, sits behind. The front man, so that's going to be um, something. He's a very, very tall player as well. This seems to be kind of a running feature of the players that Filippo assigned. He he seems to realise that Irish players, by you know, just by by their natural instinct, they're not six foot four, six foot five, kind of t- very tall players. They're they're ranging between the five nine to the six one. So he's looking for that kind of aerial difference in in, in threats. Um, I've spoken to a player who played with, um, oh, his name slipped out of my head. He's the centre back, Sonny. Is it? Abibi. Yeah. Is it? Uh, no, not, not Alicia Abibi. The, the nice. Sta- oh, uh, Natastad. Natastad. Um, and he was, he said to me that he has a quality that could play in the championship in England. Like he has those qualities within him, which is very exciting for. A League of Ireland team to be getting a player of such caliber that has the talent within him that could be playing at that kind of level, like you can kind of imagine. And if he reaches the with the right coaching, if he reaches that kind of heights, what what kind of player he's going to be for Dundalk, and particularly with the fact that he's playing alongside a player who has played in the championship and Andy Boyle, so like they, they could play really well. And Daniel Cleary as well, who has experience with Birmingham City and Liverpool. Like, you know, there is quality within that defence. And then you've got Cameron Dummigan, who was a, a player who was completely under the radar um, has really performed very, very well, particularly in Europe last year. And Dara Leahy, an Irish under-21 international. So in terms of the back four or the back five or whatever, what way Filippo will deploy, he's got a lot of strength there. Now, Sam Stanton has kind of come with a lot of flair a lot of a lot of fanfare a lot of people seem to be talking a lot about him and um, it remains to be seen like you know I, I wouldn't be judging players based on one preseason friendly against bohemians to be honest with you but by the looks of things there's aspects to the quality of these players in particular the the latvian player that's arrived in for us he looks like he could be very very dangerous in terms of set pieces but also that threat down the right wing which has been vacated by Sean Gannon, something that he loved to do when he was at Dundalk, that he was given that 
kind of freedom to to push down the right wing and create create chances from the right. Um, so like I mean, uh, in terms of junior, um, he was very good when he was at Derry. I remember I remember him being a Derry um two years ago. And he was excellent, a real real threat there. So that's something that the dog players would be very well used to. And then um, Jesus Chino, well listen. He was due to come to us last year, and um, then I'm led to believe he got a designated, not a designated player position, but he got a, um, basically the way that the MLS system is, is that they have to bring in a certain amount of college graduate homegrown players into their rosters every year. He was allocated one of them at New York City FC, who are the American affiliate of the um City group, Manchester City's group. Yeah. So, I mean, this guy has been trained with a very high caliber of coaches in a very high performance standard in New York last year. So, I mean, if this guy is under that kind of amount of coaching, I'd like to see what he's going to do when he comes to Oriel, what kind of qualities he's going to bring to the team along with the likes of, and there's actually a player who I've, I've completely forgotten about talking about, um, uh, Brian Garkland. Like I know that he's, people are saying that he's kind of going on in years and whatever, but he was absolutely exceptional during the second half of last year's experience. And he was my man of the match in two, at least two of the Europa League games last year. Um, so he's going to bring that leadership as well, along with a guy who's been at the club for 10 years um, this year and Chris Shields. Like, there's still an awful lot of quality in that side. And I think if you are able to gel these players in, and I know from, from listening to Pat Hoban's interview, like they're saying that, these guys are starting to fit in, and but it's up to those players like like Patrick Huben, like David McMillan, Brian Garton, who have been there before, and Chris Shields, who set the standard for these guys to rise up to. And if they do, then we're in for a good season. I actually forgot, and maybe on that list of ins, that young lad mm. O'Kane, who you mentioned earlier on, Ryan well. he, he could be he could be good this season as well. You know, he's seventeen, I believe. Yeah, he's 17 years of age. He's 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 a player who signed a professional contract with the club. Um, you know, I would be, I wouldn't be exactly throwing him in to start every game. You know, this is this. He's only 17. We have to remember this. There's still a lot of development and give him a Phil you know, Foden role. In, yeah, exactly. And you know, you can see, you can, but you can see how those trinkets of 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 those small pieces of appearances that Phil Foden was given at the beginning of his career. To now, he's you know it's it's about blooding players like him in, and if you get the likes of Ryan O'Kane, if you're able to plug one of those players, maybe one or two every year, and start blooding them in, you know all of a sudden you're getting uh, not necessarily a conveyor belt, but you're definitely getting quality players that you're able to bring into the site, but have been surrounded by the culture at Dundalk. They don't have to you know begin to immerse. They already know what it's about. They already know what what's required of them. And if that is the case, then, you know, you can see with the right coaching, which if I'm led to believe Filippo is, is definitely that, you know, you never know what could happen because Filippo is is known for talenting and nurturing young players. Yeah, well, obviously it sounds like, you know, with all the players coming in, it's going to be, I suppose, an exciting year because it's going to, it's a bit of a mystery kind of in terms of the players and what they're going to bring for you. Because mm-hmm. I know in previous seasons, you would have got some some newer players in like Kolovic yeah. and Odua and stuff like that. But you would have known the core group of the squad. But now it's kind of like a, a totally new squad almost coming in with some core members. So kind of from your perspective, if you're looking at the season, what would be an ideal season for you? Or what would you take going into this season now without kind of throwing all your cards on the table and, and saying <laughs> you want to win everything? But in a realistic sense... Mm. On a realistic sense, look, um, uh, listen, the, the, the players have said it themselves, the, the, particularly one or two of them, you know, um, from, from interviews, they're not there just to make up numbers. They're there to fight to regain their league title. Now, I know the Shamrock Rovers are just as strong as they were last year. Now, I bet they've lost Jack Byrne and Aaron McAniff, which was core kind of composite of um, their midfield. It was their linchpin, so to speak. Now, if the papers are to be believed, there's a certain former Dundalk player that's that's uh, due to return to Shamrock Rovers, he could, he could fill the gap, but that's not till July. So you have to think about what kind of team is, is he going to put Ronan Finn back in that midfield um, that he was at Dundalk, that he was absolutely excellent with? 
So it's going to be interesting. They've also lost a player like Greg Bulger as well. Um, Greg Bulger was an excellent servant for Shamrock Rovers. And um, in the 2008, uh, 2019 FAI Cup final, like he changed the game when he came on. You know, and he did the same at Cork City. Like, you know, he was one of those kind of players that, that had it in his locker to change a game. So they've lost three key midfielders, in my opinion. And that's going to be, that's a huge gap to fill. So Stephen Bradley still has, you know, a, a job in his hands of how he's going to do it. But the battle is always going to be, but then, you know, you've got, like, it seems that every team is strengthened across the, the league this year. Like, Pats have, Pats have signed very smartly. Stephen O'Donnell's got, you know, um, a, a good couple of good players brought in there. Then you're looking at, you know, Shamrock Rovers with Shan, Sean Gannon, Sean Hoare coming in. And then, uh, you know, we we don't know what kind of the Bohemians are always up there and thereabouts. You know, they've Keith Long has them playing some fantastic football. So it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. Um, I think if we have a good league campaign, um, I'm not going to say whether we're first, second, third, or fourth, but uh, and and good cup runs. I think we we need to remain respectful, is what I'm trying to say, but. I think with the quality of the players that we have, I think we're in with a shout, and that's and that's being polite about it. Yeah, well, I think what you probably ideally want is to hit the ground running rather than mm. because I know in previous years Dundalk have been notorious for being slow starters, and I think that's yeah. ultimately what kind of affected just last season, and the season was kind of just brought short as Pahu. We were, we were only when, when when the break happened, we were only three points behind, uh, you know, and there was still a lot of football, and then it was a truncated eighteen league se- eighteen league end to the season. Then the issue started to emerge at Dundalk. It, 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 we didn't restart very well. And because of that, you know, the gap just widened. Shamrock Rovers, by the, you know, just the momentum was with them. And, you know, when there's, you know, people remember all the big results in, in, the, in the title seasons. I remember, like, in in uh, one season with Dundalk, like, we went down twice against Limerick, and then we came back to win it 3-2. Like, it's those games that you that, that, that win your league titles, and it's those kind of grinding out results where the football isn't pretty. Rovers got that last year. Rovers, in games that they would have dropped points previously, they didn't, and all credit to them. Um you know they they got they won their league title and and fair play, but they learnt from previous seasons the mistakes that they need to to sometimes they can play all the pretty football in, in in the world it won't get you the results. They knew this time sometimes when they go to certain grounds they had to grind out results and get the win and that's what they did and that's what makes you champions. Now I have to do this with everybody. I have right. to get a preview <laughs> of where you think you'll finish. Now I know you didn't want to kind of give it away there, but I have to get off mm. everybody. Of where you think Dundalk will finish come the end of the season? Heart says first, head says second. And who gets first? Rovers. Oh, okay. Well, I think be that's a very strong second half to their season. And yeah, that's I, just, I, you know, but they've got they've got quality still in that team that can that can turn a game that can turn a game on its head. You know, Graham Burke um, was. Andrea. In in the in the in the cup final last year, um, in December, like he he had a couple of opportunities that you just you know your heart kind of skipped a bit. And Kieran Sadler did that for me against Cork as well. You know, every time Sadler got on the ball, you you you, you kind of went, oh god, here we go. Like in Graham Burke's that kind of player. He's the player that uh, people get off the edge of their seats, you know, and and they and they want to watch him and and Dylan Watts as well. Like there's still great quality in that side, so. Um. Yeah, my my heart saying, "Oh yeah, we're going to win this league," you know, and then my head saying, "You know, hold yourself in." <laughs> well, I do have to say, I, mm. I, I do respect the the non bias of your of your opinion. Mm. I always feel like you yeah. give a kind of fair, evaluated uh, opinion without mm. kind of getting ahead of yourself, and that's what I wanted to get you on because I always yeah. feel like you do speak sense. And this is not, I've had you on for for a half an hour here, so I can't thank you enough for for coming on. No and, problem. And giving your opinion, it's been fantastic having you on, and uh, hopefully we can get you on again during the season because uh, I'm sure a lot of the Dundalk fans listening to this will will uh, will make sure to tell you that they've been listening and tell you that they really enjoyed it. I certainly have. So, Kieran, thanks so much for for popping on and and having a chat with Dundalk for me. 
No problem at all.